Italia. Thank you, Mirdiji, for those very kind words of introduction. Um, Honorable Chief Guest, Shri Dr. Rai Ranger, respected dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen. Our today's topic for a Ration Lecture is Entrepreneurship and Nation Building by the very eminent Dr. Raminder Singh Ranger, MBE, FRSA. I was asked to spend a few minutes to introduce today's topic. It's rational in remembering Dr. Satya Paul and to introduce our most distinguished speaker. Um, I thought I would do so by highlighting some context and raising a few questions within this vast topic. I'm sure you would all agree that the need for entrepreneurship in the industrialization of our country has a very special relevance today, wherein we are trying to make the most of the demographic dividend of a young, talented workforce. Trying to find sources for employment, the just released Indian Economic Survey for India notes, sir, in fact, quoting Liu Kuan Yu, since the Industrial Revolution, no country has become a major economy without becoming an industrial power. In India, on the other hand, whether measured by industrial employment, which has, has averaged since the 80s around 3% of total employment, or by industrial output on average 10%, the industrial sector, rather than growing, quote-unquote, is shrinking, and indeed major parts of the country are in effect, quote-unquote, de-industrializing. As a benchmark exercise, the survey further underlines the, the, that most new industrialized economies, such as Korea's in 1990, had achieved almost 30% peak employment in the industry before its share started to decline after reaching a fairly high level of GDP. Even if you are to believe that services are a panacea for generating employment, the fact is that most of the service subsectors that have shown high growth are those which require a significantly high education and attainment. In effect, excluding from the India story, Bharat, for which or very often only has a primary education. In other words, relying on an Indian Silicon Valley is certainly not alone the answer. Neither, however, would be brute force resource mobilization. Even if you look beyond the government, which is struggling each year to manage its budget, the, real the reality is that many corporate balance sheets are also stressed today. We today have one of the highest debt equity ratios for any emerging market private sector globally. One out of three BSE 500 companies have an interest service coverage ratio of less than one. And as per the IRBI alone, if you add restructured assets to NPAs, the ratio crosses over 10% total banking assets. A very unsettling situation if you, given the limited equity banks have. Therefore, in a nation of, con of constrained resources, certainly better utilization of resources at every level, the very definition of entrepreneurship, is perhaps as relevant as it ever was. However, what should this entrepreneurship be? Growing up and learning from my grandfather, Dr. Sir, Dr. Paul, I remember many conversations about the idea of entrepreneurship and its relevance um, towards an ideal of a shared destiny. How he mentioned many times how truly great businesses are by those who create value for others and who contribute to society, and how wealth is not a benefit but a responsibility bestowed on an individual in the samsara of life. This, I was told, was true long-term thinking. But how relevant is this philosophy today in a world that celebrates quarterly earnings, market capitalization, mega deals, and quick pro profits, however fleeting? Moreover, as Warren Buffett notes, nations choose Olympic teams on the basis of med merit, not heredity. The ability to command the, res the resources of a nation should always also be based on merit. But that then presents the question, how do we encourage and support the entrepreneurs of the future, or even within our organization, the intrapreneurs of the future? both to give them the opportunities as well as the appetite and a value and ecosystem that prides effort, risk-taking, and that accepts failure. And what if we believe, and what, and if we believe this is important and values are relevant, what values do we celebrate? My grandfather, like many stalwarts of his time, believed in a very large set of values, and um, I think you've heard a lot uh, uh, from my mother discussing them. But the question today is how relevant are these values? And more broadly, if we believe in a certain set of values, how do we imbibe them in our organization and in our societies and in ourselves? And how much is education truly an answer? My grandfather, a freedom fighter, believed that it was only through education that an individual and a society could rise to do the extraordinary. He had a fundamental belief in people that in that if one invested time, effort, and resources in the development, the rewards for organization for society are immense. But at the same time, it was many of his life experiences. Um, for he mentioned to me when I was very young that his most formative experience of business was his time he spent in the freedom struggle because it made him fearless and because as a lot of our business schools, I guess, would say today, he had his best networking because he met all the future leaders of tomorrow. 
To answer so many of these fundamental mental questions and navigate these paradoxes, I'm truly really delighted to have the privilege to introduce Dr. Raminder Singh uh, Ranger, member of the most excellent order of the British Empire, fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, entrepreneur, philanthropist, a giant of a man in so many spheres of life, we felt it would be best to share a short video that provides some glimpses of his extraordinary life. Can we please have the video? The video. Dr. Rami Ranger, MBE, is a remarkable person. He is a truly multidimensional man with a passion for business, politics, and community service, which has culminated in him being honored by the Queen on seven occasions, six times for business and once for community service. Rami's story is a fascinating one. He was born two months after the assassination of his illustrious father, Shaheed Nanak Singh, who was against the breakup of India on the basis of religion and was assassinated by religious extremists. Rami, having lost his ancestral home and breadwinner, started life in a refugee camp in India with his mother and siblings. His mother instilled the right values which formed the foundation for his success. Today, Rami is the chairman of Sunmark Limited and C. Aaron Land Forwarding Limited, two of Britain's fastest growing companies with a combined turnover approaching £200 million and growing fast. Both of these companies received the most prestigious award from Her Majesty the Queen, the Queen's Award for Export Achievement in 1999 and the Queen's Award for Enterprise in International Trade for five consecutive years from 2009 to 2013, with the Prime Minister himself, the Right Honourable David Cameron, presenting him with a fifth award. This is a unique achievement and has made history in British business. As if this wasn't enough, he was once again honoured by the Prime Minister when he presented Dr. Rami Ranger with the GG2 Leadership Award for Man of the Year and paid special tribute to him, not just for business, but for his social and philanthropic activities. This is uh, the Man of the Year Award, and the winner of this award is, I believe, living proof of the spirit of enterprise and entrepreneurship amongst British Asians. I was hugely honoured to go to his business premises to see him be award awarded one of the many Queen's Awards for exports that he has had. He is a great man, a great friend, a brilliant entrepreneur, someone who's put an enormous amount into this country, created jobs and wealth throughout this country. Ladies and gentlemen, the GG2 Man of the Year Award goes to Rami Ranger. Rami was named the Institute of Directors Director of the Year for a large company for 2013 for the UK and continues to receive numerous accolades for business and commerce. Rami was also recently elected Vice President of the highly prestigious Institute of Export and made a Freeman of the City of London. In 2005, Rami was also made a member of the British Empire for his services to British business and the Asian community. He has a great passion for political and social reform to help all that he can within Britain. Rami was the co-founder of the British Asian Conservative Link. The organization was formed to make Asians more publicly and politically spirited and to help the Conservative Party become more representative of modern-day Britain and has been successful in making the Tory party more inclusive and now has five members of parliament where before there were none. Rami is the founder member of the Hindu Forum Britain, which was set up to unite all the different Hindu organizations in Britain so they could project a cohesive voice. He felt that it was essential for the public to know about the Hindu religion and the contribution that this peace-loving community made to enrich British life and to ensure that they received due respect for their faith and that frivolous depictions of Hindu deities were not put on items such as shoes and carrier bags. Rami is the chairman of the British Sikh Association, which promotes interfaith dialogue and a peaceful coexistence. This was set up to celebrate the vision of the Sikh gurus for a united mankind. In memory of his illustrious father, Rami set up the Shaheed Nanak Singh Foundation. The foundation works for peace between religions and communities. An annual memorial lecture is held in India, and in 2013 was delivered by the Indian Minister for External Affairs, Mr. Salman Khushid. Rami firmly believes that today's youth is tomorrow's society, and we have a responsibility to do our best to shape the future of our country. To this end, Rami is a fellow of the Prince's Trust, the charitable group presided over by His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, which works to give opportunities for extra education and training to young people to help them build brighter futures. Rami also helps many other social and charitable causes. He recently donated 200 
£250,000 to the London South Bank University to set up the Dr. Rummy Ranger MBE Fund for Enterprise Excellence and the Dr. Rummy Ranger MBE Centre for Graduate Enterprise. The centre was opened by the Right Honourable Theresa Villiers, Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. Rummy said that he hoped the centre would empower people through education and enable them to free their imaginations and that would play a part in helping them achieve their aspirations. Rummy has also addressed numerous prestigious establishments, including Cambridge University and most recently the London School of Economics, to share his inspirational journey. To keep alive the memory of the great Mahatma Gandhi, Dr. Rummy Ranger donated £100,000 to the Gandhi Memorial Trust Fund to build a statue of the great man in Parliament Square, London, and to keep alive his principles of non-violence, which have become even more pertinent in our fractured world, so that more people could be enlightened by his teachings. In all, Rummy has done his best to put back into society from where he has received so much and become the change he wanted to see. Um, I think very inspirational indeed, I'm sure you all agree. In fact, I'm delighted to share with you all of you today that Dr. Ranger, in fact, is flying tomorrow to London, along with Honorable uh, Finance Minister Arun Jaitley Ji, as the major donor to unveil the Mahatma Gandhi statue at Parliament Square. Thank you, sir. You take a lot of pride and regard for us in this, in this journey of yours. Dr. Ranger, as an Indian, as an alumnus, in fact, of the school where we are today, on behalf of the APJ Sat and Savran family, it is truly a pleasure and privilege to invite you to address today's oration. Thank you. Thank you, Nishan, for such wonderful introduction, very kind. And today, we are not only celebrating the life of a great man, but we are also celebrating the love of a daughter for her father. No wonder people say daughter love their parents more. This is a living proof. It's a great honor for me to be here and to share my journey with you. So Mrs. Shushma Paul Berliaji, president of APJ Satya Swan Group, co-founder and chancellor, APG Satya University, General J.J. Singh, former chief of the Indian Army, Sartre Lochan Singh Ji, former head of the Minority Commission, my father-in-law, Group Captain Lamba, and many other distinguished guests. And also, I would like to thank Nishant, Neha and Aditya for being such wonderful hosts and making me feel that already here. And I must not forget Anjali Paul, the daughter of a famous Lord Paul who has inspired us, still inspires us, and we are indebted to leaders like Lord Paul for setting the standard for us to follow. So Anjali, welcome. Thank you. It is an honor for me to to be asked to deliver the APG Swarn Dr. Satya Paul Memorial Lecture 2015. Not often do we come across multi-dimensional people like Dr. Paul who were larger than life and touched the lives of so many with their deeds. Dr. Satya Paul was a great visionary, an industrialist, philanthropist, educationalist, and above all, a patriot who fought for our freedom. We owe him a debt of gratitude. They say, what we do for ourselves will die with us, but what we do for others will live on. I'm here to celebrate the life and legacy of a great man who has left a permanent mark in the world. His apparent passion for knowledge gave birth to APG Satya Group. Through the APG Group, Dr. Satya Paul will live forever in our hearts, and his legacy will bear testament to what his life was all about. It is through education we realize our ambitions and dreams and become assets for ourselves, our families, and our country. I would like to acknowledge 
Mr. Sushma Paul Berlia for his distinct dedication in keeping the mission of our illustrious father alive and taking it from strength to strength, aided by her three dynamic children. And of course, her husband, uh, Vijayji, I believe he's not here, but we would like to thank him because they say behind every successful man there is a partner. Of every successful woman, there's husband, or vice versa. So you cannot achieve much alone until the partnership appreciate each other's vision. It is a great privilege for me to be asked to speak from the platform from where Lord Paul, an iconic British peer, spoke last year. Lord Paul is held in the highest esteem by everyone who knows him or have heard of him. He is also the younger brother of Dr. Satya Paul. It just goes to prove that nobility runs in the family. This year, the theme of the lecture is entrepreneurship and na nation building. In fact, entrepreneurs are by definition nation builders. They go the extra mile to benefit others with their lives and as a result, strengthen the fabric of our society. As you can see, the school, APG, is providing holistic education to children. And I dare say one day, all universities will be like APG. They will not have the tunnel vision to just make people academically brilliant, but they will also develop their other aspects of life. So this is a, a cutting edge institution which we are witnessing. I believe if I share my philosophy with you, then many of you will appreciate how easy it is to be an entrepreneur and a nation builder. Besides, it is always good to learn from others' experience simply because we cannot learn or experience everything ourselves. I am the chairman of Sunmark Limited and Sea Air and Land Forwarding Limited, two of Britain's fastest growing companies. <clears throat> One is marking the marking fast moving consumer goods, known as FMCG products, and the other is a logistic company moving cargo from A to B. Both companies have been recognized by Her Majesty the Queen for their contribution to British economy. Sea Air and Land Forwarding Limited received the Queen's Award for Export Achievement in 1999. Sunmark Limited has won an un Precedented five consecutive Queen's War for Enterprise in International Trade. This is a unique achievement by any company, as no other British company has this accolade to date. Thank you. I was also made a member of British Empire in 2005 for services to British business and Asian community. I've demonstrated that one does not need to have a rich father or an elite education to succeed in life. However, one does need certain quality to be successful, and I'm here to, to discuss those with you. As you saw, my father was assassinated two months before my birth for opposing the breakup of India on the basis of religion by religious fanatics who could not understand his vision of united India free from rivalry. My life began in a refugee camp in India, aged two months and no father. However, I was fortunate to have a remarkable mother who worked as a teacher and brought up eight of us through immense difficulty, having lost her country, ancestor home, and above all, the love of her life, our father. She could not give us financial support, but instilled the right values in us, which became the bedrock of our success. I came to the United Kingdom in 1971 to study law at the young age of 22. 
Due to financial constraint, I was unable to complete my studies. My brother, who was already in the UK, gave me profound advice when I could not find a job. Britain today is a totally different place because the first generation have changed the attitude of the British people by working hard, by becoming successful. Before, we had no track record of success. We were just newly arriving immigrants, and nobody knew how to treat them. So it was very difficult for anyone to take us seriously. He told me that as an immigrant, I was starting my life in United Kingdom with minus 15 marks. I was surprised. I said, what do you mean? He said, first of all, less five marks for being an immigrant and being in a foreign country. Another five, less five mark for being a non-European and of the wrong color. Thirdly, another less five mark for not having UK education and also a foreign accent. An accent can change the perception of many. As a result, he said, I needed to work harder for less than the locals. And my sub first job was a car cleaner. You can imagine who felt I used to consider myself as a hero, and I became a zero. And I was now on the street cl cleaning cars. But my mother used to say, you must take pride in whatever you do. And you know, <laughs> you should never be ashamed of work. She said, whatever job you get, you do it to the best of your ability. And the day I got a compliment from my boss, our cars are looking beautiful. And that day I said, I have arrived. My second job was a chef in KFC, getting 35p an hour. I said nothing, though, you know, a lot of money. Then. However, through sheer hard work, in less than two years, I became a district manager of the same organization, running 10 store. I used to tell my friends, I may not be Harvard or Princeton or Oxford or Cambridge, but I do have PhD of chickens. I can, <laughs> I can do a good job when it comes to frying chickens. So I was running 10 store, became the number one district manager. I uh, broke every sales record, whatever. They say, if you're not fit for small job, you're not fit for bigger job. So you got to make sure that the job you do, like General Sav is here, if you wasn't a good soldier, you wouldn't be chief. Yes? So therefore, you have to be the best. I also gained experience from working as a manager for both Curry's Electrical Store and McCain Foods. They specialize in frozen food before starting my first company. I discovered that with just five principles, I could surge ahead. You know, we often do not take time to communicate with ourselves. We do not have time. We are running around, like, working from A to B, you know, taking orders and discharging our duty, but never have time to sit down and communicate with ourselves to find out our abilities or our capabilities. And it's very important that you do find time and relax and talk in your mind with yourself, question, answer, and you'll be amazed how you find those answers. All these five principles, we are born with them. And I'm here to share them with you today. First of all, self-respect, good work ethics, commitment, vision, and empathy for others and I will elaborate those. Number one, we need self-respect, as without it, we would cut corner and would not hesitate in letting our customer or employer or supplier down with dire consequence to our reputation. It is the most important thing, what will people think of me? It is our responsibility to make sure that they treat us with the respect we ex want them to respect us. If people cannot rely on us, then they will not take us seriously, and they will not support us. So 
Second is work, work ethics. That's very important. We must show loyalty to our employers and customers alike. Our motto is we only succeed when our customers succeed. I believe we must work hard for the success of our customer, which in turn becomes our success. Empathy for others is important, as no one can progress if they have no consideration for others, consider their superior or junior. No company can grow if the customers are suffering because of an I'm all right, Jack. I don't care. I'm only worried about me. That way you cannot build a world-class company. If we treat our customer right, then we can build a reputation which is essential to grow our business. Today you saw the Queen's Award. They represent excellence. It is very difficult to get even one. Number four, it is important to have a vision. As without one, we are headless chickens, un unable to find our directions. We must, have the, we must have a target of where we wish to reach and must plan accordingly. We have to have target or goals in life. We need a total commitment, of course. We need total commitment to work as there is no substitute for hard work. You can find substitute for sugar or plastic or something else, but there is no such thing as substitute for hard work. You have to get your hand dirty. Those who watch the clock continue to do so while those who watch their work surge ahead. You know, there are guys always watching. Is it 5 o'clock now? Is it 5 o'clock? And that attitude is not going to take them far. I started my logistic company in 1987 with capital of just two pounds from a rented shed. Because this is a service industry, you don't need money for plant, machinery, or anything like that. Like a doctor, accountant, solicitor, you're selling your services. My job was to collect cargo from somebody's house, deliver it to the airport so that it could be on forwarded to their destination and take my commission. So it was easy for me to move into service industry, but in service industry, people always remember your service. It's not just buying a television. They can buy from A, B, and C, just move shops. It is your service. Either your doctor is with you for life, or you will change him, or like a solicitor. You don't change people who give you service. The marketing company was launched in 1995, and it is now exporting British product to 130 countries with staggering results. You have to look beyond the obvious. As a logistic company, I came across a lot of customers who were buying British product. And I said, I'm sitting on a captive audience. These people are coming and buying. Why shouldn't I help them? If I help them, I help myself. So I decided to source product for them just for, so that I can keep their freight business. Unbelievable response I received because unwittingly, I was able to remove seven, eight profit centers. They say, you make profit while buying. If your buying is right, your selling is right. Because I was able to eliminate those profits, and my, I became the most competitive supplier for them, and business just snowballed. In, in less than 20 years, we're not even 20 years old, our turnover is just touching 200 million, and is growing over 20% a year. And because this is a 100% export-led company, because export generate many jobs. We ship nearly 15,000 containers a year. They are haulier, the transport company, shipping company, packaging, manufacturing. This is where the prime minister came himself, not someone who is importing cheap product from China and flooding the market and destroying the jobs of the British people. It's the other way. Export generates wealth and employment in the country. So therefore, export is vital for the survival of any economy. Our company has been added to to the Sunday Times profit track as one of the most profitable company for the past three years running. If you pay tax, you make profit, you also pay tax. I'm very proud those who avoid or evade taxes are not going to build a world-class company. I also became the Institute of Director, Director of the Year 2013, as well as the British Export Champion. 
How did I do it? Simply by understanding my subject in depth. Here is an example. Well, life is very simple. I'm not a highly you know, educated guy, but just a education of life, and uh, they say is a streetwise. So I became a streetwise because of my circumstances. Here's a very simple example. How come two medical students who attend the same medical college, read the same book, and are taught by the same professor for the same length of time and receive the same degree, yet end up as, in, as two very different doctors? One is respected by patients, and they travel from far and wide places to see him. And the other just gets by and fail to earn recognition. You might have seen people traveling to see a doctor 5,000 miles, 2,000 miles, because that doctor and the other doctor is just getting by. The answer is very simple. One takes time to understand his patient and in establish the cause and method of treatment. He will not rush. He will take time. If need be, he will pick up a phone, take a second opinion or third opinion because he wants to be known for his craft. Unfortunately, the doctor who is, after, who is after quick reward cannot be bothered with the detail and as a result is not respected. Sim similarly, we must work hard to be the best among the rest by going the extra mile. Mediocrity will not bring us the desired result. Casual effort produce casual result. It is as simple as that. You know, when we arrived in the UK, we realized that the, if the Englishman is working five days, we'll work six days. If we work 10 hours, we'll work 12 hours. We had to overcome our handicap. We had to compensate with something else, but not being negative, being positive force. It always pays to be a false positive. We may be able to get by, but we will not make a mark, nor will we be noticed by others, unless, of course, we are perfectionist. They say excellence endures, it remains long after everything else is forgotten. Many of you will start your career working for others, and many of you may move into your own businesses. In, any, in case you start in the family business, then my suggestion to you is to first learn the rope from the bottom up. This way, you will learn from your personal experience, which is essential to build a strong foundation to take on extra responsibility at a later stage. For those who will start their career working for others, they should work as if it is their own business. Otherwise, they will only work when they are being watched and as a result will not develop their true potential. I always tell my people, any staff, I say, you don't work for me. You work for you, for yourself. Do not work, you are never working for others, you're working for your own self to realize your own potential, your own ability, so right attitude, wrong attitude. We must have the ability to get on with our senior and junior alike and must never become opposition leader to our superiors. You know, if people start giving trouble at this level, you're not gonna promote them. This is all very common sense, and unfortunately common sense is just not so common sometimes. So we must never become opposition leader to our superior. Instead, we should try and take some pressure of them and act as a pressure well, easing their workload. We must empathize with their position. You know, we may have one ball in the air, they might have six, but this is how I was promoted to district manager. No special you know, qualification required, just the right attitude to appreciate the other's point of view. The result is that our spirit will always like to work with us rather than those who speak disrespectfully and induce unnecessary pressure. Our attitude toward our junior should be such that we should take the time to explain the rationale behind our instruction so that they too can appreciate where we are coming from. We shouldn't expect them to be just mere yes men or typewriter. We must explain to them, they will start enjoying we must make them feel important and encourage them to do more and help them to grow and develop so that they too can become assets. 
We must always add value to whatever we do. Here's another example. Anyone can serve McDonald's, but the person who serves with charm and politeness will be noticed and bring respect not only to the establishment, but also to him or herself. I was greeted very nicely by the APG student and corporate staff and everything. They, all, they brought respect to themselves to, to, you know, and to the organization. We must always try to mix with people who are more successful than us. This is what General JJ is saying. I am here in his company, and Sadat Lohja saying, because I can learn a great deal from people who are a lot more accomplished than myself. By standing with us, we appear to look tall, but in fact, we are not. It is paramount to join bodies and organizations which represent the field we are going to be in, as this will keep us abreast of what is going on in our field. This also offers us opportunity to network with the right people in our chosen field. The difference between success and failure is very simple. A successful person works hard to benefit others <clears throat> so that they, so that he or she is liked and respected, whereas failure regards it as his his or her divine right to be loved and respected by everyone, regardless of his or her own attitude and behavior. So it is our responsibility to demonstrate to people that we are useful. You know, I just want to tell you one story, because I think it's important that you know. Once upon a time, when I was a store manager, my district manager used to call me from Birmingham because, you know, he was on a tour. Can you do this for me? Can you do my children are stuck in school? Can you go by I'm in the traffic? Will you go and so one day, thank you. One day I said, okay, I will do that. So I did that. Then he said, I've got guests there. Can you arrange this, this? So I did a couple. My, my assistant manager came up to me. He said, Don't you realize Frank, Frank Poole was our regional manager. He's using you. And I said, I'm I know. I'm worth using, but you are not even worth using. <laughs> so it's very important if people come to you for help because they trust you, they believe in your capability. It's going to have a positive attitude, not looking at the wrong way. So we must always remain an asset and never become a liability to anyone, whether they are our parents, employer, customer, or suppliers. An integral part of life is facing challenges and finding solution for them. Here is how I found solution to growing my business. In order to grow businesses, one need to merge, acquire, or forge strategic alliances with companies. As I only had two pound capital to start my business, I could neither acquire a company nor did anyone want to merge with me. So I was left with the third choice to forge strategic alliances with like-minded companies who are in the similar situation. The logic is very simple. When one, one cannot afford to fight the competition alone, then one needs to join forces with others to become a credible force in the market. Besides, anyone in Expo need local knowledge which is crucial in establishing oneself in any market easily and quickly, and that too, without much cost. They say, when we share our profit, we also share our cost, but double our strength. By having local partners on the ground, we were able to export our product to many countries simultaneously with unbelievable results. This is how we entered 130 countries in less than 20 years by plugging into the already established distribution channel of our strategic partners. Now, question is, how do you find strategic partner for collaboration? It is easier than we think. They say, hidden talent is no talent. As a result, we must tell everyone about our business and what product and services we can offer and what benefit we can bring to the table. 
we must exhibit our product and services where, wherever we can to tell the world what we are all about. When we exhibit in trade fairs, we can be sure of finding right people who are also in search of product or services to grow their businesses. There are far fewer time wasters in exhibitions as no one will spend time and money to travel to trade shows for mere sightseeing. By exhibiting, we, we come face to face with our potential customer or future partner for collaboration. If you find yourself in the export business, then I strongly suggest that you ask the trade department at embassies, at embassies to put you in touch with companies engaged in similar business to that of yours in their countries. By piggybacking on, on them, we can get into any, any market easily, and that too without prohibitive cost. I believe a step-by-step -step approach to, to, grow, to grow your business is the right way forward. I never encourage anyone to take risk with their livelihood as well as that of their staff. My success is the result of collaboration and cooperation with others, and I encourage people to make the most of their strategic partner. And I was encouraged to see that APG is also doing the same collaboration with so many different educational institutions to bring expertise from one another's field and to give that student that extra uh, benefit. I've always said, by sharing our profit, we double, double our strength, and I do urge when you have the chance to do the same. I can summarize my approach to business with the following analogy. Our approach to business must never be like that of Hunter, who likes to go for a quick kill. Instead, our approach should be like that of a farmer who works hard for, for a bumper harvest over a period of time. Before I can conclude, I would like to pay tribute to my adopted country, Great Britain. It is because of the British sense of tolerance and fair play that an ordinary person like me could realize and fulfill his ambition and become an asset for his family and adopted country. We must never discriminate against anyone on the basis of their race, religion, or gender. If we do, then we'll turn assets into liability for ourselves or our country. I wish all of you very best in your endeavor and hope that you will make yourself and your family very proud with your achievement. Thank you. In the words of Victor Hugo, perseverance is the secret to all triumphs. Dr. Ranger's glorious life aptly reinforces this axiom that there is no substitute for hard work. His is the story of hope and accomplishment of aspirations and achievements of hard work and reward. Thank you, sir, for enlightening us with uh, your words of wisdom and uh, for sharing with us your mantras of success. We'd like to seize this opportunity and request you to answer a few of uh, the questions from the audience here this evening. So I um, invite you to ask uh, questions to Dr. Ranger. Anybody from the audience? Is there anyone who would like to ask me any question, something which concerns them? Okay, sir. Can somebody give him a mic? Sir, I'm Professor Amit Sareen from APJ School of Management, Dwarka, New Delhi. Hello, Professor. Yeah, hi. It is, uh, it is so impressive to hear uh, you. It's very inspiring. 
And uh, I wanted to ask the question that how do you, like you are the best person, you have been to UK, you know India also. How do you compare the entrepreneurial environment between UK and India in terms of ease of doing business, in terms of uh, cultural environment, in terms of government support, or in general the entrepreneurial environment between the two countries, what is your comparison? That's a very good question. First you, of all, I must tell you, in 1947, two countries were created. One to promote people on the basis of their religion, one to promote people regardless of religion, and that is India. We owe a great deal to our leader who opted for secular and democratic constitution, where people are equal, their equality is enshrined in the constitution, regardless of race, religion, gender, anything. The result is that we are taught to use merit and not race or religion. There are countries, they, they are based on religion, then they systematically try to undermine or to discriminate against a section of their own population and score their own goal. You don't have to go far. You can see across the border what is happening. So we are so grateful to our leader, the founder of India, who gave us secular constitution where we become equal. Regardless, whether I'm from Madras, Andhra, UP, Punjab, we are one. So that helps Indian to integrate into any society, anywhere in the world, because they become part of the fabric. They are not, I can go as far as to say, we are a liberated community. There are some communities, you'll find them in ghettos, but the Indian people, they might arrive into a ghetto, but soon they disappear into every part of Great Britain. So we have no conflict. We share each other's value. Britain is a rule of law, respect for women, respect for everything. We have the same. So our everything is same. And uh, today, Indi Indians have done so well in America, Canada. It is all because of the leg, you know, the, the constitution or our leader who made sure that we never use race or religion to such help. Anyone else? Uh, can, we, uh, can we just have one question? Uh, one more question. Oh, okay. Oh. Well. Neha has a question. Oh, sorry, I have one Neha, question. Actually. Are you going to trip me? <laughs> Sorry, uh, so uh, Dr. Ranger, actually, my question was related to culture. So I, I actually had a specific question. I was wondering how you manage to maintain the culture in your company. This is a big question for us, the younger generation, because we're struggling, you know, because uh, the, the world changes so fast, and uh, I think culture is very important, especially for a business. You see, our culture is very old. It is probably the oldest civilization in the world. So we should be very proud of our heritage, our ancient, whatever you call it. It is because of that culture we are what we are. Because we have never been taught to, you know, take undue advantage of anything. The very fact that so many people, nationality, religion, survive in India shows the strength of our country. And diversity is a strength. You know, if you walk into a park, you just see one color of flowers, you will enjoy it. But different color of flower, India's diversity, in the world of my father, he used to say, India's diversity is like the color of a rainbow. Its charm will diminish if one were removed. That he was pleading to the Muslim leader of don't cut and run, that India will be secular and democratic country, one man, one vote. Together we'll make our destiny, but don't do break up you know, the union. So therefore, our culture, wherever we go, is respected. We enrich the cultural life of that people. Today, the Bollywood is respected, loved by so many people. The Bhangra music is so popular across the world. Indian food is, I remember when I arrived in England, the native used to say, we can't stand your food. Now they can't get enough of it. How we have educated them to a good, decent curry. So there are now restaurants in every corner 
of Britain, a world. So therefore, I think there is no, you know, we should uh, leverage each other's qualities, cultural diversity is so good. It's only a good thing. That's it? Ah, there's a gentleman here. Yes. Oh, PhD Chamber. Yes. So, Mr. Wala. Yes. I would like to say that India is going ahead with Make in India program. Make in India. You must have heard our Prime Minister Make in India. Sir. So what do we need more to do? Because uh, we have already said Make in India, but we are not achieving the results. There is a proverb, lock your door and don't call anyone a thief. Uh, if there is no red tape, there is no obstacle, no restriction, no <clears throat> stoppages by the bureaucrats, here I am, an ordinary man who goes to England where the system works and I become successful. You bring somebody into a system which doesn't work. I always give example, if you take a first division player, a football player, and put him in third division, he will struggle. So India has to open up Remove all those barriers. The biggest asset of a nation is its people. And here I see is break here. You can't do this, you can't do this. Where is it, where is it? All the time, the, there are bureaucrats not to help you, but to hinder you. Please tell me, I'm Indian. I'd love to set up a factory tomorrow. But I know, you know, when I export a container of biscuits, let's give you an example, which are made in England, fit for English, European community, they're not fit for in India. Yes? They will stop, harass, while the goods are being expired. Every trader, businessman will export goods to test the market. If the products are accepted, then they come to the country to open factories, like Nis Nissan, Datsun, Toyota. They first export car from Japan, then they see the market is good. They we are shot down at the first step. We're not even given chance to uh, test the market so that we can plant machines. People will be queuing to invest in India if the system become business friendly. But this type of problem is always there. Our Indian mangoes, they were banned. Fish, fish that was also banned in America. So sometimes something is... But uh, you see, those are question. There are question of standards also. They just don't ban because they don't like India. We are the most respected, loved people in, in Europe or in the world. They know Indians are an asset. But if you have a farmer who's using far too much fertilizer, and for that reason the mangoes have a lot more you know, chemicals, then you have to ask that person, because the mangoes are coming from Pakistan, from Bangladesh. Why not India? They have nothing to against India. We are buying product uh, on merit. And we are today, I had to compete with the best in Britain. It's always about merit. If, if, you know, merit is very important. If you become, they will queue, they'll come for your mangoes. Provided we have the best mangoes, they, may, they, they meet the required health standard. But now the mango ban has been lifted, by the way. The good news.